Welcome to Employment Law This Week. I'm George Whipple. On October 26, the NLRB issued its final joint employer rule. The rule goes further than the Obama-era definition. Any employer with a contractual right to impact employee terms and conditions can be found to be a joint employer, regardless of whether that authority was ever exercised. Here's Epstein, Becker, Green, Steve Swirsky with thoughts on the implications. The new rule, if and when it takes effect, is going to have a tremendous impact on employers in all industries in this country. Almost all companies use subcontractors or they use suppliers or they use other vendors who may provide goods and services to them. And when they retain those other employers or those other contractors' services, generally there are standards that are set in terms of what is acceptable performance. Those types of factors are likely to lead to a finding of joint employer status using the board's new test. Not surprisingly, legal challenges began within days of the rules publication. Epstein Becker Green's Aaron Schaefer tells us more. There have been two legal challenges to the board's rule, one filed in the Eastern District of Texas, one filed in the DC Court of Appeals. In part because of those challenges, this week the board announced that its rule would not take effect until February 26, 2024. It had originally been scheduled to take effect in December 2023. As these legal challenges continue to wind their way through the courts, we also expect that there may be subsequent delays, including a possible nationwide injunction issued by one of the courts until they can sort out whether the rule was properly promulgated. We've also seen congressional Republicans attach riders to the NLRB's budget that would prevent the board from spending any funds to change the current joint employer standard which this rule is seeking to do. This rule, combined with an NLRB ruling from August of this year, opens the door to real exposure for non-union employers. The board's recent CEMEX decision made it easier for unions to demand recognition from employers and increased the chances that if an employer commits an unfair labor practice during an election cycle, that the employer would be ordered by the board with or without an election, to bargain with that union. The lower standard for a bargaining order, coupled with the lower standard for joint employers, increases the risk that companies will be dragged to the bargaining table by the NLRB, even where their employees have not voted to be represented by a union. Epstein, Becker, Green, Steve Swirsky, tells us how the NLRB's joint employer rule falls into the greater context. What's interesting about the board's decision to publish this rule now as a final rule um, is that the NLRB is one of a number of federal agencies that are looking at the question of joint employment. The U.S. Department of Labor has also spoken about joint employment, has also prepared a proposed rule. That rule has not been finally adopted yet. The standards and the tests that I expect will develop under these various rules are not aligned. They're not identical. The standards are applied differently. Um, It creates, I think, you know, further uncertainty for employers and for employees when uh, the outcome may be different depending on which agency um, is looking at the question. Thanks to Steve and Aaron. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.